We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all for joining us here for today's session. My name is Serena Fu. I'm the Research and Program Associate at um, the Global Network Initiative. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to briefly introduce our discussion. Um, the Global Network Initiative is very pleased to be convening this discussion, and we're very grateful to the Internet Governance Forum organizers, the multi-stakeholder advisory group, and our very distinguished panelists for making this happen. This is a really timely moment to be discussing the human rights due diligence as more companies are voluntarily conducting it, more stakeholders are being engaged, and more governments are considering mandating it. GNI has long worked to encourage human rights due diligence by tech companies, including through our principles of freedom of expression and privacy and our detailed implementation guidelines. Over the last decade, GNI has fostered insight and discussion on these matters among our members, including through our unique assessment process, where we've examined member companies, due diligence policies and practices in detail. More recently, our members have expressed interest in deepening these discussions and making the lessons learned and good practices that we see publicly available in the form of guidance and recommendations. Last year, we created a new human rights due diligence working group to take this work forward. And just last month, we entered into a partnership with Dunstan and his team at uh, Business for Social Responsibility to engage with us on this work. So for today's discussion, we'll touch on the importance of ensuring that our human rights due diligence work engages key stakeholders and that regulatory efforts that relate to human rights due diligence facilitate and support collaboration on this work, including through co-governance initiatives like GNI, rather than unintentionally disrupting or potentially creating barriers to them. So this workshop will utilize a roundtable format in which our key questions are addressed by all of the participants and our speakers here today represent key perspectives from government, civil society, and academia. And they'll provide short framing com comments in response to the questions. And as the moderator, I'll actively involve all the participants in the discussion. Um, so I'll take a moment now and uh, we'll pass it on to our speakers. We have a great lineup today. First is Catherine Block Vigberg, Senior Advisor and Responsible Value Change program manager at the D Danish Institute for Human Rights, Mr. Mengi Hassan, the director general of Pakistan's ministries, international cooperation wing, Usama Kilji, executive director at Bolobi, Ramiro Alvarez Ugarte, Center for the Study of Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at the University of Palermo, uh, Dunstan Allison Hope, Business for Social Responsibility, and Renee, senior policy advisor at the Netherlands Ministry of economic affairs. Um, so I'll now give the floor to our speakers and they'll introduce themselves, speak for two to three minutes on what perspectives and experience they'll bring regarding human rights due diligence. And then we'll have time for some um, discussion and question and answer at the end. So with that, maybe let's get started with Dunstan. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of work with human rights due diligence. And um, could you talk a little bit more about your experience with it and um, introduce yourself as well? Great, thank you, Serena, and thank you for the introduction. So as Serena mentioned, I'm with BSR, or Business for Social Responsibility. We are a nonprofit organization that works with companies on human rights issues, um, as well as other topics like uh, climate change and, and social justice. And very much looking forward to this conversation. I appreciate the, the invitation. Um, we've been undertaking human rights assessments with technology companies for the uh, past decade or so, uh, some of which are publicly available, but most of which are, are not. Um, we've undertaken many dozens of assessments. And in reflecting for this session, um, what struck me was the way in which they come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, so we've undertaken assessments of companies entering or leaving or staying in a market. 
And we've undertaken assessments of companies introducing a new product or service or adding a feature to an existing product or service. Uh, it might be a merger or an acquisition or a sale. Uh, we might look at customer relationships in, entire, in an entire industry vertical, or sometimes it might be a single industry uh, customer relationship. Sometimes we look at content policies for social media platforms. Other times it's about access to remedy mechanisms. Uh, we've undertaken sector-wide human rights assessments um, and also assessments for multi-stakeholder efforts like, uh, like GiveCT. So um, these assessments come in a wide variety of different shapes and sizes and the timeline available to do them can also vary dramatically. Sometimes the company says, we have a month, we have a decision in a month's time, you know, that's, that's how long you've got to do this assessment. Other times it can take uh, two years or more. And so reflecting for this session, um, what struck me was given this diversity of, of assessments and timelines, how important it is to keep front of mind the essence of a human rights assessment. And I wrote down three things. Um, first of all, that an assessment should be uh, an assessment of impacts on people against all human rights contained in international human rights instruments. And that sounds obvious, but for companies, this emphasis on impacts on people, not impacts on business, is an important shift in mindset. Um, second, that engagement with rights holders and stakeholders, especially those at heightened risk of becoming vulnerable or marginalized, is especially important. Um, and then third, uh, that we need to identify appropriate action that the company should take to address those impacts. And in that context, there are just a couple of other things uh, I think it's important to remember. And um, first of all, that human rights assessments are a good starting point to stimulate dialogue and discussion inside companies and create action plans to address human rights issues. They are only one part of a broader system of human rights due diligence. And sometimes we fear an overemphasis on the assessment as distinct from the broader system within which it sits. And then second, that I think we're only going to realize uh, human rights in law and in practice if we think of an entire, if we think of entire systems. Uh, sometimes when we're undertaking human rights assessment for an individual company, we fear too much emphasis on one company and not enough emphasis on the overall system. So I'd encourage us to think about uh, overall systems and how different companies, different stakeholders, different act actors um, play together. So with that, um, looking forward to the discussion and hearing from our next speaker. Serena, back to you. Thank you so much, Dunstan. And I thought that was an excellent way to sort of introduce the discussion and frame it and remind us that human rights impact assessments are about the people. Um, so next we have uh, Mr. Uh, Mangi Hassan, the Director General of Pakistan Ministries International Cooperation Wing. Um, Mr. Hassan, could you tell us a little bit more about your experience with uh, human rights due diligence as well as the Pakistan specific context? Um, if you're speaking, it, I think you may be muted. Okay. Are you listening to me now? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for letting me allow to describe some of uh, things related with the theme. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, organizers, Catherine and uh, Dunstan. Uh, if I don't spell and pronounce the name, please forgive me uh, because of specific uh, issues with the languages. Uh, we had a very good talk uh, from Dunstan, uh, Alison. Uh, it's a recent phenomenon in Pakistan, uh, particularly, uh, although the guidelines are some years back of the uh, United Nations General Assembly. Uh, let me assure you that Pakistan uh, commends IGA for conducting this session, very important session indeed. Uh, and uh, at least high priority and importance because uh, uh, nowadays, particularly in the uh, eve of uh, having uh, human rights businesses and digital uh, issues, online issues, and uh, the workforce involved therein and the human rights particularly, uh, for those uh, who are signatory and uh, state party to a number of conventions, particularly the core conventions, uh, they are responsible, uh, actually. Uh, so we appreciate uh, uh, 
the stakeholders, including government's role, uh, precisely in human rights due diligence. Uh, how to do it? Uh, it is uh, still new phenomenon, and we will uh, be able to learn from each other's experiences, particularly in the Dell countries. Uh, and we are also fastly growing uh, towards that uh, end. We, we are demonstrating our commitment to the United Nations uh, guiding principles by launching our first ever national action plan. Uh, on business and human rights during September, very recently uh, this year. And you would be amazed to note that we, we involved each and every uh, stakeholder, the trade unionist, uh, the uh, labor force, uh, multiple labor uh, uh, unions uh, and business entities, chamber of commerces, industries, uh, and also uh, with support of the United Nations Development Program, uh, so it is the first ever uh, national action plan uh, in South Asia. Uh, uh, you may recognize it. So uh, now when the national action plan uh, has been dealt uh, through an inclusive multi-stakeholders consultative process, there are recommendations from both duty bearers and right holders, uh, which have been uh, incorporated uh, in the uh, action plan. And this action plan has been approved by the highest forum uh, of the government by the cabinet. Uh, and we have disseminated uh, this uh, uh, action plan and particularly uh, because it's a cross-cutting uh, due diligence of human rights, whether it's labor rights, whether it's fundamental human rights, because the uh, constitution of Pakistan also provides for fundamental human rights. Everything is inbuilt, but beyond that, uh, we have extended chapter of nine core human rights conventions, wherein the civil liberty, uh, right to expression, right to freedom, uh, dignity, uh, non-discrimination principles, uh, all are inbuilt. So uh, human rights and businesses cannot be taken into consideration in isolation. It should be together with the all human rights instruments, declarations, covenants, conventions, and other treaties uh, obligatory for any of the states. And I think more, uh, most of the states are signatory and have ratified these treaties and protocols and United Nations guidelines. And in some cases, uh, the resolutions as well, because they talks about, uh, and uh, uh, so it is important and imperative that you should involve every stakeholders in order to disseminate information, promote awareness, and building some protocols because uh, ultimately you will need to adopt some some of the mechanisms wherein you can uh, you can act uh, uh, in terms of the due diligence. So due diligence must have some uh, some mechanisms uh, together. Uh, government as a regulator uh, and also uh, uh, authorizing the regulating body to have due diligence uh, in a cordial environment with the industrial. Uh, communities, with laborers, with other stakeholders in order to have oversight uh, and review of the human rights and businesses, particularly digital uh, sort of things. So Pakistan's national plan of action, let me take two more minutes, uh, if you allow me. Uh, quickly, I will go through that. Pakistan's national action plan proposes 69 actions around eight priority areas, uh, including financial transparency, Anti-discrimination, very important. Human rights due diligence as one of the area, uh, as a cross-cutting also, and also as one of the area. Labor standards, child labor, forced or bonded labor, occupational health and safety, and access to remedy. That is important because uh, I talked about the mechanisms uh, should be in place at various levels to have due diligence uh, and insight uh, required for uh, such uh, availability of human rights. Corporate human rights due diligence, as we know, is a key component of the global business and human rights discourse. Pakistan's national action plan includes these areas, as I told you. Uh, due diligence regime through a smart mix of measures. This includes exploring opportunities for legislative and policy reform as well as incentive mechanism to promote business respect for human rights. That is also very important uh, for us as well. Like other countries in the region, Pakistan has a large informal 
economy. Additionally, various economic sectors are constituted by complex value chain, which may be multi-stage or fragmented. Uh, in nature, with a combination of several formal and informal corporate sectors. Therefore, we encourage dialogue. Uh, we attach priority, in fact, with the dialogue and participation process, which proposes effective measures for the application of guiding principles and human rights due diligence in this complex opting environment. So uh, I will not take more time. Uh, HRDD is an ongoing exercise. We will learn uh, from each other uh, and uh, major steps uh, as already identified access uh, actual or potential adverse human rights impacts, integrate findings from impact assessment across relevant company process, track the effectiveness of measures, communicate how impacts are being addressed. That is important. Uh, so since the launch of uh, First ever, uh, first ever in the uh, South Asia, uh, National Election Plan on Business and Human Rights Ministry has also notified that uh, and also notified Secretary, which should be the mechanisms for due diligence at the first place. And thereafter, together with consultation of the stakeholders, we will proceed further. So Pakistan look forward to the next decade for implementation of the guiding principles and is committed to its part in this year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's really great to hear about Pakistan's uh, national action plan on business and human rights. And I'm sure for the discussion later, um, the other speakers and panelists will be interested in speaking more about um, some sure. of your um, actions. So next up, we have also from Pakistan, Mr. Usama Kilji, Executive Director at Bolo B. Um, Usama, could you take a couple minutes to introduce yourself as well as speak to um, uh, your expertise regarding human rights due diligence? Thank you very much, Serena. And uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this session. Um, I think I also want to congratulate Serena uh, for doing an excellent job in organizing this session and moderating it. Uh, I know it's your first IGF and you've been wonderful. Um, uh, I just want to speak, you know, start by commending the Pakistani government, the Ministry of Human Rights for setting up their um, uh, National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights as articulated by Mr. Mangsi just now. Uh, I further want to speak a bit uh, about uh, a bit about civil society's role in um, uh, human rights due diligence. And I want to address a few layers, especially when we talk about technology companies. Uh, I believe there's a lot of work that has to be done by especially global technology companies when it comes to human rights due diligence when they're entering markets. And so far, what we've noticed that a lot of their decisions are motivated by the business and profit motive, so much so that uh, consideration for the impact and the human rights impact of their presence in certain territories and countries countries has not been really taken into account. We have examples of what we've seen with technology companies role in Myanmar, in Ethiopia, and um, also in other places such as India, where you know, we've seen the proliferation of uh, viral um, uh, misinformation and disinformation. And uh, we've seen that in Brazil as well, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we've really noticed the, the, the really grave human rights impact that technology companies' presence can have. And I think it really speaks to the critical need uh, for technology companies to carry out human rights due diligence, be transparent when they do so, and involve local civil society voices and other voices in these processes uh, so that they understand the market that they're entering. Um, they're able to uh, you know, do business in that territory in a more informed manner, and their presence does not really perpetuate further issues or violence. Um, and I think that's very important. The second thing I want to really address is, um, you know, the lessons we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's ongoing. The reason we're all speaking on Zoom right now is because of the pandemic. Otherwise, we'd all be freezing in Poland. Um, but uh, what, what's very important uh, is that, um, social media companies, technology companies also consider uh, how 
unintentionally, they may be perpetuating inequalities because of their businesses. And I'm speaking about, you know, more vulnerable populations uh, that are, uh, that, that, that are uh, impacted by technology. So for example, if we look at education, so what are technology companies doing to make educational more, education more accessible to a larger number of students worldwide, right? Uh, but really also, are they educating people on how to use their tools in a better manner? So I think it's not enough to sell the technology in certain markets, but I think part of the human rights obligations of these corporations should also be uh, further training in these uh, ways. So for example, it would be wonderful for technology hardware suppliers and software suppliers to come into countries where there's literacy issues and maybe conduct trainings along with local actors on how to, for example, uh, improve access to education through technology. And that's just one example that I'm, I'm giving. So I think the point I'm really trying to make is that human rights due del diligence should not only uh, think about what the impact of technology would be negatively, but also think about what's the positive impact that these technologies and their companies' presence can have in different territories across the globe, and how um, they can further the cause of human rights and of fundamental rights in different territories. Thank you. Thanks so much, Usama, and thank you for your kind words at the beginning as well. I, I wanted to pick up on that last point you made that you know human rights impact assessments don't necessarily just have to be about the negative um, aspects of you know or the impacts of human rights, but also the potential positive impacts as well. And I think that's maybe a little bit less touched upon in these discussions. Um, so maybe next we can go to Ramiro Alvarez Ugarte at um, Sele. Um, Ramiro, I know Sele has just recently published some papers and your research on human rights impact assessments. Could you speak a little bit more about that as well? Yes, thank you very much, Serena. It's a pleasure to be here and to share this conversation with you. Um, we're a research center, and as uh, academics and researchers, we thought about looking into this business practice uh, about a year ago. Um, and we, we were happy to do so. We started in a way with a little bit of um, uh, not so much knowledge about it. We were not experts on business and human rights. Some of us had worked on human rights before, but not from the point of view of, of the relationship between business and human rights. Um, so we basically did two reports. One of them, it's a conceptual history of human rights impact assessments as a tool, uh, which is probably less useful and interesting for those of you who have been working on this issue for so long. But we thought that it was uh, interesting in and of itself, but also useful, especially for civil society practitioners, and especially in Latin America, which is our region of focus, because we felt, and this is the reason we launch ourselves into this research that a lot of practitioners, especially in civil society and NGOs and activists, were not aware of the, of the tool uh, and, and the usefulness of this tool, especially in the ICT sector. Um, the second paper addressed, uh, and it was desk research, which probably needs to be complemented by further methodologies, but our desk research tried to address the issue of the use of human rights impact assessment by ICT companies. And we think we got out of that research with three main insights that I would like to share with you. Um, because I think they're useful to, for the conversation moving forward. And I also think they're good departing points for further research. The first of those insights has to do with um, a general issue, which is transparency. We believe there is not enough transparency in terms of how human rights impact assessments are used. We weren't able to access many of these human rights impact assessments. Uh, we were sometimes able to access summaries of those reports, but we weren't able to, to find uh, the full versions of those reports, except in a couple of circumstances. So there is a first thing that seems important to me about the, to us, I should say, uh, about the transparency around human rights impact assessments. Um, we also found a general problem, which 
I believe it's a general problem that we should address, which is there is a general lack of clarity in terms of how human rights standards can guide conduct, especially on this field, uh, and especially with regard to platform and internet companies. Um, there is simply um, not enough knowledge, we believe, in terms of what are the effects that these technologies have on populations when they're deployed. Uh, it's very easy to deploy these technologies into populations, but we do not know exactly what the effects of those technologies are. And I think this poses a very substantial challenge to the idea of assessing impacts of technologies on human rights, because if we do not have a clear picture of what mechanisms are underway, uh, what the, their effects are, and if we don't have enough research of those effects, especially research produced in different societies and in different contexts, it's very hard to actually assess this, uh, the impact that these technologies have on human rights. And finally, we find that, uh, we find that companies are really eager to acknowledge uh, negative impacts when the, that negative impact is the outcome of a, of a traditional bad actor, which is a state, for instance, asking for censorship or requesting them to eliminate certain content that uh, is protected by freedom of expression and so on. We see uh, a little less eagerness in recognizing themselves as bad actors, as as uh, guilty, to put it in a way, of uh, producing a negative impact on human rights. And this, I believe, is related to the previous point, which has to do with lack of, uh, of adequate research in terms of the effects technologies have. Um, those are our main, um, main insights from those papers. We look forward to keep uh, uh, deepening and strengthening our research, and we look forward to take part in the conversation. Thank you so much, Ramiro, for, uh, for that very great overview of the findings from your research. And um, I, I'm, I'll in a little bit put in the chat a link to the research as well, if um, we can find it. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Renee from the government of the Netherlands. Could you, uh, I know, I'm curious about uh, the Digital Services Act and specifically the component on human rights due diligence and mandatory human rights due diligence. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, sure. Um, I hope you can hear me well. I had some issues uh, connecting, but uh, it seems to be working fine. Um, so first of all, let me thank the uh, the members of this organizing committee for uh, inviting me to join uh, this panel discussion and also the uh, um, uh, Serena, you in particular for organizing this uh, uh, this, this session. Uh, I know it's uh, not easy. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my involvement in the negotiations on the uh, Digital Services Act, uh, sort of a EU law and content moderation online. Um, for those not so familiar maybe with the, uh, the, the legislative proposal, um, really quickly, it's a um, uh, legal text that sort of regulates the content moderation obligations that um, uh, social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter uh, have and that operate across Europe. Um, so it sort of sets standards in that sense um, for those uh, companies. Um, and I think I'd like to hone in on three aspects of the due diligence section that the DSA contains, um, which I believe are kind of conducive to uh, the protection and promotion of, of human rights online, uh, in particular freedom of opinion and freedom of expression online. Um, when it comes to, so first, when it comes to content or speech moderation online, because that's often an issue that we've talked about in the context of the DSA, um, uh, when it comes to those rules specifically around removal, I think it's sort of, uh, the discussions always boil down to two fundamental questions, which are uh, who draws the line and where do we draw the line? And I think the DSA provides the right answers to these um, uh, questions. Um, as for who draws the line on what is legal or illegal, uh, the DSA does not define what is constituted or what constitutes as illegal content or speech online. Uh, instead, it relies on the definitions or refers to the definitions that are being used in the relevant EU or national laws. In other words, 
uh, laws that have been passed by democratically elected governments. Um, and as for the where question, uh, the due diligence requirements that deal with removal or must carry decisions by, by online platforms or uh, social media platforms, um, such as the so-called so notice and action mechanism, we can talk about that more in a little bit if you'd like, uh, apply to legal content only. That is to say, um, they do not sort of touch upon any other content that is maybe deemed harmful or undesirable by some, but isn't necessarily illegal. So it's very important that the scope of those removal obligations um, remains limited to legal content. Um, second, uh, there are uh, due diligence provisions uh, in the DSA and throughout the DSA that sort of force online platforms, uh, social media platforms to be transparent to their users um, uh, about the ads that are uh, being served to those users, but also the content that is recommended to them. And I think this is really an important point. Uh, this transparency has come back uh, in the panel too, I've, I've noticed. Um, it sort of chimes with the April 2021 report of the UN Special Rapporteur um, uh, Irene Khan, where she sort of explains how uh, the right to form and develop one's own uh, uh, opinions should not be impeded by uh, any coercive or involuntary you know, cons consensual manipulation. And she sort of equates those, uh, uh, that sort of uh, non-consensual manipulation to techniques that are being used by online platforms, such as uh, content creation through platform recommendations um, or micro-targeting. And um, I think the rules in the DSA is about advertising transparency and recommender systems are sort of a welcoming step in this respect and help or enable the user, uh, the end users, uh, to, to sort of inform themselves of how this information is presented to them and, and why that is presented to them. So this helps them to, uh, it is meant sort of to set up uh, uh, a protection for, for um, the end user's freedom of opinion. Um, thirdly and last, um, the DSA also sort of removes barriers um, for due process for end users who disagree with content moderation decisions that are taken by online platforms. So there are a couple of avenues that are being presented to, to end users, such as uh, ourselves. Um, um, platforms have to set up internal complaint handling uh, systems, states, member states, such as the Netherlands or, or the uh, member states like France have to set up, uh, provide for out of court dispute settlement systems whereby users can turn to those out of court dispute settlement systems if they disagree with a decision that was made by a platform to remove certain content or, or uh, uh, um, carry certain content. Um, and all of this doesn't prevent users from going to court if they really feel like their rights uh, haven't been uh, vindicated or represented enough. So there's a couple of those points that come back in the DSA that are very helpful, I think, for the uh, protection and, and promotion even of, of fundamental rights like uh, freedom of expression. Um, there's a couple more, uh, but I'll leave it at that for now and then we can maybe turn to the uh, Q&A session afterwards. So thank you very much, Rina. Thank you so much, Renee. And last but certainly certainly not least, we have Catherine from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And Catherine, I know uh, the Danish Institute has published some guidance on human rights impact assessments as well. Um, would you like to speak a little bit more to that as, as well? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Serena, and thank you for inviting me and uh, very pleased to be a part of this discussion and uh, and in a group with such uh, great speakers and, and fellow panelists. So, um, yes, as mentioned, um, I work as the program manager for the Responsible Value Chains program, which is a part of our human rights and business department at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And the Danish Institute for Human Rights has been one of the organizations who've been working with the topic of business and human rights for for a long time. We've been working for over 20 years on the topic of business and human rights, and uh, really, to begin with, focusing on uh, what you can call more physical business activities, engaging a lot with extractive companies, with food and beverage companies, um, helping to, them to identify, assess, and address their human rights impacts on the ground. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, we decided to embark on trying to see how our experience methodologies around human rights impact assessment for physical business activities 
um, would look like when looking at digital business activities, um, which resulted in the development of a guidance on human rights impact assessment for digital business activities, which was launched in last year in 2020, which was really developed in very close consultation with various stakeholders, many of which are in the panel and also uh, in the room here today. Um, and through that process, it really became evident to us that one of the most important areas to address uh, when it comes to um, the digital ecosystem and where it differs most when it comes to um, the challenge of uh, comparison to the more physical business activities and assessing and addressing those impacts is really stakeholder identif identification and rights holder engagement. So that's really where one of the main challenges were. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. Um, so just to uh, highlight three kind of central um, differences compared to more physical impacts. First is uh, that there is a lack of a clearly uh, identified location for the use um, uh, of the digital activities, which means that rights holders and stakeholders um, more broadly can be in theory anyone, uh, anywhere. So how do you kind of create that context of application. Context is really needed to understand, well, how do these digital uh, activities actually have an impact on specific groups uh, at a specific point of time within a specific context? Um, it, there is a risk that if we discuss uh, the impacts of digital business activities, um, at kind of the theoretical level or at the level of the digital um, activity uh, as such, it becomes much too high level and too theoretical. So how do we get it down to the ground? It's really about kind of having an understanding of that context and how a digital application in one context can have a completely different uh, impact on human rights in the digital uh, application in another context. Um, the other point is that um, new technologies and new solutions um, mean that there are limited uh, lessons to learn uh, from the mis uh, mistakes and successes of others. So really the constant development in technology, of course, means that the potential impact of those technologies, of course, always uh, develops and uh, the potential uh, constellation in which it uh, has an impact on human rights will also develop. Um, so that really also highlights the need to work across stakeholders group, uh, stakeholder groups to really understand the complexities of how uh, new technology, new application uh, will impact on, on the rights of individuals. And then thirdly, um, impacts can be very uh, difficult to identify. They can basically be invisible, um, which makes it really difficult for, for to engage with rights holders on uh, their worries, uh, understanding the potential impacts uh, at every stage, because it's simply not uh, evident what uh, these impacts might be. And just to give an example, um, for example, in the context of um, using automated credit risk ratings. Um, the person who are being subject to that type of credit risk rating might not even know that they have been um, assessed by an algorithm as to what type of risk rating that they get in terms of, of receiving credit. Um, so, so they don't even know that there is an impact on them, but there is actually an impact taking place. Um, Speaking kind of of the broader uh, stakeholder uh, roles, um, we really believe both based on our experience, based on the development guidance and the dialogue that we've had with various stakeholders that there is really a need to come together to address uh, some of these topics um, because there is really um, in our understanding uh, and also as can be seen from the panel here today, a good understanding of how you know, there is a need for different stakeholders to come together with different perspectives, both from the state side, from the uh, business side, from uh, from uh, academia, etc., to discuss some of these things. Um, so that's why we've actually um, been engaging also with the Danish government on the Tech for Democracy initiative um, to put in place an action coalition looking specifically on uh, responsible business and including under that action coalition also um, the aim to develop um, uh, 
some resources around stakeholder identification and engagement in the context of digital activities. And we're doing so also in co collaboration with GNI, with BSR, and, um, and with uh, the BTEC project, who are also involved in that, um, in that process. So um, I think kind of from, from our perspective, uh, something to discuss now that we get to the next point for, for discussion is really what can we do together um, to actually make progress here? Um, you know, there, there must be enough non-contentious issues, uh, quite basic issues that we can actually address collectively um, so that we can have a very kind of targeted discussion on the topics that require uh, more debate um, and, and joint lifting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I think you're doing my job much better than I am with segueing and transitioning into this next part with that last question. Um, maybe I'll pause there and see if any of the other panelists and speakers want to take a stab at addressing that, or um, you know, if there are any lingering questions you also wanted to raise, we wanted to open the floor for that as well. We also have, I think, a hand raised and welcome questions from the audience. Uh, Colin, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi there, sure. I'm joining here from uh, cold but beautiful Katowice. Um, I wanted to chime in here because uh, I've actually worked with um, several of you uh, from different stakeholder perspectives. I'm now uh, representing Ofcom, which is a, I think an underrepresented perspective here uh, right now, that of the independent regulator, uh, which will soon be taking up duties under the forthcoming UK online safety bill. So uh, from my perspective, I think that uh, civil society organizations like Sele and others do such a great job of helping to clarify these kinds of impacts. And then obviously DAHR is great at setting the bar in terms of the best practice and standards for uh, assessment frameworks. Uh, and then GNI and BSR and others are, are really great at kind of translating this into business practices or governance models. But I do think that sometimes there's a risk of when of talking past each other um, still, even though we're all uh, working towards common goals uh, more often than not. Um, I know that when I was uh, part of a company and actually implementing uh, human rights impact assessments and um, trying to coordinate our GNI assessment, uh, it was you know, coming in with the best of intentions and the best frameworks and the best resources um, didn't always land with the kind of operational teams or the product teams and things that I was seeking to uh, help um, inculcate these ideas with. So, uh, and you end up kind of trying to figure out what's the bare minimum, what's the cheat sheet, what can I, what is the minimum product that I can transmit the minimum idea that I can transmit to these developers or these salespeople uh, to help them realize the most salient risks and, uh, and, and then also factor this into existing governance processes. So where you have corporate governance, like um, risk assessment processes, uh, best practice around three lines of defense, things like that. I know that this is something BSR does really well as well. Um, I think now uh, coming at it with my current hat on uh, as a as a regulator, um, I would I thought that Renee did a great job of underlining different parts of the evolving regulatory frameworks, which can either support or be supported by uh, due or human rights due diligence. So things like risk assessment provisions or transparency mechanisms or um, complaints flagging reporting mechanisms, um, but. But I still think that there's uh, there's work to be done in terms of translation or um, modulation, if you will, and then also recognizing um, where the kind of levers are or overlaps are in um, parallel or concurrent uh, evolving regimes that could support these goals. So even if we're trying to maintain the high standards of, uh, of HRAAs or different impact assessment methodologies, I think that um, we shouldn't let the, you know, the phrases, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Um, and acknowledging where, um, where research agendas, other research agendas uh, might be able to support the goals. So for example, there's many different national uh, agendas coming out around things like media literacy. 
and maybe that's an, an interesting lever that could help with uh, with human rights due diligence or obviously transparency would be would be a good one. Um, and then ag again, I, I just have to stress again, I know that um, I hope that DIHR continues being the standard bearer for this like high level, uh, the, the best practice. But I think that there's also a role for um, human rights practitioners to be developing the floor as well. And I think that's where potentially regulatory regimes like that of the online safety bill, which in its current iteration contains provisions for both risk assessments and impact assessments. I think an underappreciated aspect of the online safety bill is that it will require uh, category one, essentially very large players to carry out a freedom of expression impact assessment, which I think some of us will acknowledge that that is easier said than done. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that that's, uh, that's another critical role that either existing stakeholders or maybe new a new category of, um, of human rights practitioners or in-house practitioners um, can play in, in this collective challenge. And we've got another hand in Katowice. Great, I, I don't think I can see it. So please uh, feel free to, to go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm Dowdy from the um, Technical University of Munich. And I wanted to ask, um, when conducting human rights uh, impact assessments and maybe with um, product and um, I don't know because it is actually a bit confusing because there are a lot of organizations, um, institutes that include AI in their deployment. Um, rights impact assessment, which principles are you taking into consideration um, or how do you evaluate this? And I and the second question would be also, um, how are you conducting these human rights impact assessments in the different sectors? I mean, in government and civil society and nonprofit settings. And I mean, how do you do it all together and how does it work? Thank you. Just a quick uh, clarifying question. Did you have a, a, a specific speaker you would you wanted to um, have answer the question or is this just more broadly for the, the panel? Well, I think that the person from Sele, he mentioned something about a different um, like stakeholders. So maybe he could answer the second question and the first question about the AI principles. Um, actually, it could be um, any person. So sorry, now if you like, I, I can take the second one um, on different stakeholders. I should clarify that we from Sele are just looking at this, but we haven't conducted human rights impact assessments. We, um, we are, we're trying to create a, a research line that we look into them more deeply. But from our point of view and after reviewing different guides and there is a lot of experience and shared knowledge constructed by practitioners, people who do human rights impact assessments and some of them are here uh, in terms of what a human rights impact assessment is and how it should be conducted. And in that sense, there is a special part of it and has to do with engaging different stage, uh, stakeholders on the ground. Um, so as, as we see it, and I welcome corrections or additions to this, as we see it, one of the most fundamental parts of conducting a human rights impact assessment is engaging people on the ground. Uh, it's very easy to see if you have, for instance, uh, an extractive industry, if you're going to get oil out of somewhere. You can pretty much be clear about what your impact will be. You will have an environmental impact. You will affect directly the lives, maybe the livelihood of people living there. And if that is a risk that you can create, then you have to engage them. You have to talk to the people who will be affected. You have to talk to governments in charge of uh, regulation and so on. The challenge we see on the use of this tool for technology is that that is 
much less clear. But in any case, um, this idea of involving all relevant stakeholders seems to me to be a central building block of what the tool is. Um, I would say that. And Serena, I'm happy to add a add a point in, in relation to both uh, questions, both comments. Which, um, so first of all, to the to Connor's point, I think the floor is moving. The good news is that over the past decade, the floor has risen, and we're seeing more traction across more functions within companies than perhaps we did five years ago. So that's that's the good news. I think the thing I'd really encourage for us to continue to move in that direction is conceptual clarity and consistency across all the various places that talk about human rights assessment in some shape or form. So we have the Digital Services Act. We also have the potential for managing human rights due diligence in Europe. Uh, we also have the Artificial Intelligence Act. Going back, we have the GDPR with requirements for the data protection impact assessment. Lots of different things. We would really encourage conceptual clarity on things like risk to whom. And how do you prioritize the most severe risks? Uh, how, what criteria go into prioritizing risks? How do you determine appropriate action? There's a risk that we had fragmentation across lots of different things. And then put yourself in the shoes of the company. It's hard to know which, you know, which concepts to run with, which ones to build into work plan. So to the extent that we can have conceptual clarity across everything, that would be tremendous. And UN Guiding Principles is the place to build that conceptual clarity from. So to the point that we can use that as the foundational text and uh, the Danish Institute and others are doing a really nice job of sort of translating that into, into the tech field uh, so much, so much better. Thanks, Dunstan. Um, and it looks like Catherine, you raised your hand and then you could have Renee go afterwards. Yeah, I just wanted to um, to uh, support what uh, what Dunstan was just saying on on kind of the policy coherence uh, piece being quite important. I think another piece um, which is uh, is interesting and also really important is also understanding the kind of full digital ecosystem, um, because to a great extent, you know, the emphasis is uh, maybe rightly so because of uh, what's been happening uh, and, and the type of cases that have come up uh, very much on maybe some of the bigger players or bigger actors. Um, but uh, there are also other uh, actors within the digital ecosystem that provide infrastructure, that, um, that uh, are intermediaries, um, and all of these actors also have a role to play and, um, and are maybe less in the forefront, but still central actors to, um, to actually address some of these issues. Um, so um, in that context, of course, the Danish Institute, have, uh, we've worked a bit with uh, internet uh, infrastructure uh, providers with um, top level domain registries and registrars, which has been extremely fascinating because these actors are not necessarily used to thinking of themselves in the context of, um, of business and human rights, but a, a really central exercise in understanding which role they do play in that ecosystem. So um, in terms of just kind of building upon what I also mentioned before about getting different stakeholders together and what we're also working on in connection to the Action Coalition is actually also trying to get a better understanding of that ecosystem, working with BSR, with GNI, on trying to, to get kind of a, a bit of a mapping going and understanding the different players, what their role is and, um, and responsibilities are uh, and what can be expected uh, of, of those different uh, roles and responsibilities, both within tech, but also the ones that enable it or control or um, uh, create the, the framework in which they operate. So both kind of government, but also uh, financial institutions and their role in, in, um, in uh, supporting the development of these uh, technologies. Sorina, uh, I think uh, greatly appreciating the author's uh, input uh, with regard to certain issues. Uh, I think since it's uh, uh, for the industrial uh, global uh, situation uh, and also under their uh, situation, regional situation, there must be uh, some policies as has been said by Catherine and other colleagues. Uh, based on the policies in terms of the UN guidelines, uh, we need to further uh, dissect that uh, into small pieces. For instance, SOPs, we must have 
uh, SOPs uh, in terms of the uh, digital uh, uh, diligence of the human rights in, in various sectors, in various sectors of the human rights and businesses, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the protocols on each and every issues minutely. Uh, in some countries, they must be having uh, certain protocols uh, in terms of health and uh, safety, occupations and other things uh, in terms of uh, influencing uh, uh, economic opportunities, uh, in terms of uh, right policies uh, for the uh, workplace and the workers and the trade unions uh, and uh, how to uh, involve uh, their participation, not only involve, but effectively participating uh, opportunities for them. So uh, multiple stakeholders and uh, uh, setting uh, recommendations uh, about protocols, SOPs, policies, legislation, automatic actions. Uh, and uh, I think uh, by adopting such uh, things, uh, we can uh, have feedback uh, from the, uh, as uh, has been said, from the ground levels, from the operational level, uh, so as to review uh, all policy and legislative frameworks uh, uh, with these feed, uh, feedback and uh, regularly revise if there is a need uh, so as to prevail a good uh, due diligence uh, mechanism and systems in place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mangi. And I know, Renee, you've been waiting and then we can have Usama maybe uh, finish us out with the comments. Yeah, just very quickly, um, I just wanted to respond to uh, a couple of the comments that we made. Um, maybe two points. Um, one point on the UN guiding principle, principles on business and human rights. Uh, what we've done um, as the being the council, so sort of the member states uh, deliberating on this on this legislative text in the DSA, uh, we've made sure that um, from now on uh, intermediaries, so not just online platforms, but also uh, internet uh, access providers that um, uh, Catherine, I think, uh, briefly talked about, uh, have to take into account these UN guiding principles when designing their terms and conditions. So it's one way for us to sort of try to make sure that systemically speaking, uh, um, the, these sort of actors or these companies are already thinking of uh, um, uh, these, these guiding principles when designing their services and, and their technologies. Um, but the second comment would be on the risk assessment. I think that is something that um, uh, Catherine and, and uh, Colin, if I'm not mistaken, from Ofcom briefly touched upon too, um, where uh, uh, you know there is a new, the impact of the technologies is sometimes hard to quantify, but also uh, they develop really quickly, as Catherine pointed out. Um, I think the DSA meets that somewhat by asking or subjecting these sort of online platforms, or the biggest online platforms, we call them VLOPS, it's a bit of a stupid acronym, but um, that's sort of the, um, the acronym that's being used uh, to, to subject themselves to sort of risk assessments, whereby they have to actively check sort of uh, how the use of the services, but also new technologies that they roll out, have to, uh, what kind of impact they have on uh, fundamental rights, uh, including rights to privacy and, and freedom of expression. And those are audited every year, sort of, um, and the guidelines on uh, mitigating those risks are developed by uh, the Commission, European Commission, and member states. And I think there, there is a role for um, um, stakeholders like uh, non-profit bodies, but uh, also uh, human rights uh, uh, facilitators to, to sort of uh, provide input on those guidelines. I think that's a very important role uh, that they can play. Thank you. Thanks, Renee and Usama. Please go ahead. And just to Thank you. That. I know we're yes, I know we're at like the last two minutes, but I just want to, wanted to quickly add that we've been speaking a lot about companies and about civil society uh, and the private sector. But I think it's also very important to think of the government's roles, uh, especially when it comes to say export controls of technologies uh, that may be harmful to human rights. Uh, so we've seen, for example, the export of surveillance technologies uh, by a lot of uh, companies in Western democracies that would not allow such uh, activities by those companies to take place within their own countries. 
but are happy to allow companies to export such um, uh, technologies related to surveillance that really violate the fundamental rights to freedom of speech and privacy. Uh, and I think that's also something that needs to be worked on uh, a lot more. And these discussions need to be had under the UN guiding principles. Thank you, Usama. That's um, a really important intervention to made. And uh, we have one minute left. And so um, just wanted to take that time to thank everyone for your excellent participation. This is a topic where we'll have many more conversations, I'm sure. Um, and so I wanted to especially thank all the speakers, particularly for um, you know, dealing with my uh, organizational skills and as well as with uh, everyone who's attending in IGF. Um, virtually or in Poland and uh, for all of the support that IGF has provided. Thank you and please take care. Thank you.